whoever I was having the nightmare about would, would end up inevitably in my, in my room. I went to scream, but nothing came out. That's when I noticed the bodies. I was completely frozen in fear. It was just evil. You know that sense when you think somebody's watching you while you're asleep. I see this figure at the foot of my bed. I'm freaked out. I have never felt so helpless in my life. I look up, almost like this darkness on the wall, like a silhouette. My heart was pounding and I was chilled. I just freaked out. I remember wanting to scream, nothing coming out, just, just absolute sheer terror. It gives me goosebumps to this day. When I was a child, my parents told me I was adopted. I always thought that it was special. I never had any ill feelings about adoption whatsoever, but I just didn't know anything about my past. And so it's sort of like you, you go through life with a blank slate. I always lived with that in the back of my head. But more than that, I was very, I was very different. One night, when I was nine, I was having a bad dream. I went to this old, old mansion. and I was walking towards the front porch. There was a butler who came out with a silver platter. walking very slowly. He was old and skinny, and his suit was ill-fitting. His teeth were gray and disgusting, and it was this horrible gray face. I noticed the bodies. They were all on the ground, twisted around me. I was completely terrified and just completely frozen in fear. The butler with the tray started to walk towards me over the bodies. And I went to scream. but nothing came out. So I started running. He was gaining on me.
all of a sudden, I woke up and I was hyperventilating. I couldn't breathe. And that's when the bedroom door opened. And I saw a silver platter. It was the butler with the tray. The exact person from my dream. But this time, it wasn't a dream. It was real. It was just evil. And he stood at the end of my bed, and he lifted the tray up. There was an ax on it. And he said that I would be next. I would be next. I was so afraid. And I went underneath my covers. You're OK, Carly. You're protected. And then I saw a glow, and I heard like a light woman's voice saying, you're OK, Colleen, you're protected. And it was warm, and I felt comforted. And I looked from under the covers. There was a woman who had long auburn hair with a white glow around her. She was very comforting, very beautiful. And she said, Don't worry, Colleen. You're protected. Don't worry, Colleen, you're protected. Having her call me Colleen, it was weird, but I didn't feel scared. And at that moment, I knew that the butler was gone. And again, she said very clearly with an accent, and then she was gone. I didn't know who she was. I didn't know any Colleen's, but I wasn't afraid of her. I felt like I could go back to sleep. I felt safer. For the next three years, I would have many of those types of experiences. <laughs> I had regular nightmares like anybody else, but I certainly had other things happen that were more paranormal. I had regular nightmares like anybody else, but I certainly had other things happen that were more paranormal. Whoever I was having the nightmare about would end up inevitably in my, in my room as an apparition. And every time I would see an apparition, the woman was always there, and she always said the same thing. She said, it's OK, Colleen, you're protected. <laughs> At the time, I didn't know what was going on with me. You have no foundation to tell you your history or your lineage. And as much as the people who adopt you want to give you all of that, they can only give you so much. You are okay, Colleen. You are protected. When I was 12, dreams like that, they stopped. Never felt frightened again. And I never saw her again.
how do you explain something like that? It really took me years to figure out how all of it formed my life and, and those experiences and what they meant. Years went by. All through my 20s, I started my career in television. I moved from Montreal to Miami. I've never had anything happen. My curiosity about my birth family was always there. I just didn't know anything about my past, but I think I was very curious to know what my background was. And that's what prompted me finally to call a detective. Four weeks later, he said, your mother and father, I found them. So I called my birth father. And a man answered the phone. So I just said, hi, is this Vincent Michael? And he said, it is. And I said, well, this will be the strangest call you've ever received. And he said, should I sit down? And I said, yes. And then he said, is it you? And I said, yeah, it's me. <laughs> and we had an amazing four hour conversation. I was elated. He told me all about my mother. He told me I had sisters because they got married and had two other daughters after I was born and um, put up for adoption. Not long after that, my mother and I exchanged a letter. About a week went by because they were divorced and she was remarried. And I'd spoke with my sisters by then. I had spoken with my father. The only person I hadn't spoken to was her. I wanted to handle it a little more gingerly. So I flew her out to meet me in California. When she walked through the door, I remember just feeling complete and utter panic and excitement and joy. She said, um, Colleen, are you my Colleen? She said, is it you, Colleen? I was so freaked out because it's a name that I had heard my whole life through that woman, but never meant anything to me until that moment. And she said, Colleen is a term of endearment for Irish girls. Having her call me Colleen it was just mind-blowing, thinking back to all those times where I was terrified and always having that woman in the room saying that. When we hugged, I felt so comforted and warm. It felt really great. And she told me that when I was born, she was able to have me for five minutes to hold me. She said that the doctor said to her, this baby has the light. In an Irish folklore, my mother told me that meant that I was protected by St. Bridget of Kildare, who watched over children that didn't have parents, children that were in need. My mother believed that I would be watched over through St. Bridget of Kildare. I almost collapsed. Then there was no doubt in my mind. It was St. Bridget of Kildare. I knew she was the woman in the room who protected me during those times of terror. I've never told my mother about the incidents because she was very affected by putting me up for adoption. And so I didn't want to tell her anything that happened to me that was scary in childhood. 
I think through her Catholicism and her Irish background and her beliefs, she absolutely found a way to comfort me. And it was through St. Bridget. I have no doubt in my mind that that's exactly what happened to me. She was always there. She was always there. I think I see this white figure, and it's almost as if I needed that moment to help me realize that this where I am right now, it was the lowest point I had ever been. I'm very grateful to have such a wonderful woman as my mother. She's that rock of the family. I'm the youngest of four kids, so I was her baby. I'm not ashamed to say that, and I still am. I'm a mama's boy. I guess you could say I was a grandmama's boy as well. My relationship with my grandmother was wonderful. She would cook these massive meals for the entire family. That way, this way. I used to love to help her in the kitchen when she'd cook and just really bond. And it's really good. It's nice. It's really good stuff. <laughs> just the sweetest woman you'd ever want to meet. I always knew that she was there for me and would always be there for me. I was 32 when she passed away. I always sort of felt pain because I was unable to, to be there with her when she passed. Just a few years after my grandmother passed away, I had the most difficult time in my personal life. I was going through a divorce. I have two children, so it was extremely difficult the day that I left, looking at the faces of my two kids, and knowing that not only is my life never going to be the same again, but neither is theirs. Didn't think I could get any lower than that. have two children, so it was extremely difficult the day that I left, looking at the faces of my two kids and knowing that not only is my life never going to be the same again, but neither is theirs. Didn't think I could get any lower than that. I had left my house, and a very good friend of mine let me stay at his guest house. My friend shows me the guest house, Shows me around, it's not big at all, but to me it was like staying at the Taj Mahal. I just needed a roof over my head and a place to, to close my eyes. He leaves about a day or so later with his family to go on vacation to Hawaii. I'm there by myself staying in the, the guest house. The next morning, I get a call from my mother telling me that she has something to tell me and like me to come over. So I go over to see my parents and I can tell there's something amiss, there's something wrong. It's, it's not everything is, is right here. So when I ask her, just, she matter of factly just sort of says, I've got cancer. I've got cancer. I don't know if I can describe that feeling, uh, the emotion that you have, because it's your mom. You want to help her. But there's nothing I can physically do other than just hold her and tell her that I love her. I have never felt so helpless in my life. 
So I'm driving back from having just left my mother's house, and I pull up on the street where I'm staying. You know, I'm just inundated with all these thoughts of everything that's happening. You know, a divorce, I'm not gonna see my kids as much, work isn't going so great, my mother's got cancer. All I keep thinking is, why? That was without a doubt the lowest point I had ever been in my life. I'm sitting there on the street in my car, pitch black outside. And I noticed something. The lights in the guest house go on by themselves. So the only thing I can think is that somebody has to be in there. This freaks me out a bit. So I get out of my car and slowly walk up the driveway, go to open the door, It's locked. I unlock it. I walk in. As soon as I close the door, lights go off. I turn them back on. And check everywhere inside the house. Because obviously, I wanted to make sure there was nobody inside the house. Check all the doors. Everything is still locked. Everything was fine. Nobody in the house. That was a little strange to me. I was exhausted, physically and mentally exhausted, so I decided to just climb into bed. I need to just unwind. So I grabbed my laptop, and I started looking online, just sitting in bed. I'm thinking quite a bit about my mother and I'm looking through a few different sites and this little ad pops up to purchase rosary necklaces. My mother's a religious woman and I thought that I'd love to get one of those for her. She could have this rosary on and wear it and every time she looks down at it, she knows that I'm thinking about her. So I clicked on it and found something that I thought would be great for her. So I bookmark the page, mental note, getting that for my mother first thing in the morning. Go to sleep. You know you get that sense when you think somebody's watching you while you're asleep. <laughs> then I hear this voice. Nobody there. I was scared at that point. I was confused. And at that moment, I see this figure at the foot of my bed. And I see this woman that then I make out to be my grandmother. I recognize the voice. It's warm, it's comforting, it's loving, saying, it's okay, Danny, it's gonna be okay. She was wearing just a white dress. She had that blue apron that she used to wear when she'd cook. Do that? Really? That's how I knew it was her. 
And before I can say anything to her, she says it again. It's gonna be okay. And then she's gone. And I'm looking wide awake. I don't know if I was scared at that point, if I was amazed. The emotions were just sort of around me. After that, I don't sleep much the rest of that night. So I wake up the next morning and I, I, the only thing I thought was, I have to go tell this to my mother. As I head out, I open the front door. There's a box sitting on the front doorstep. No return address, nothing else. A little odd, I pick it up and open it. As I head out, I open the front door. There's a box sitting on the front doorstep. No return address, nothing else. A little odd, pick it up and open it. And inside is a rosary necklace right there. I'm freaked out, don't know where it came from. Nobody knew I was even thinking about this, that I was even considering this. The next morning, it's on my doorstep. So I immediately, I, I get in my car, I drive over to my parents' house, I get there, spill my guts. And it's just, Words are flying out of my mouth trying to explain what had occurred to me the night prior. She looked at me and she said, it's gonna be okay. And I told my mother that my grandmother said, it's gonna be okay, Danny. My mom was just as calm as could be. And she sort of said, yeah, that was mom. That's what she used to say to me. That's what she always would say to me as well. And she's looking out for you, and she's looking out for me. She just accepted it. And when I offered her the rosary, she said, No. I'm supposed to be for you. Because everything's going to be OK, Danny. Everything's going to be OK. To my mother, it all made sense. To me, I guess it does now. Since that night, I've asked myself, was my grandmother right? Is everything okay? My personal life has never been better. I've never been happier. My kids are great. I've got three jobs. I got a wonderful new place to live. And my mother, been through five rounds of chemo, lost her hair, it's on its way back. She's battled it like Rocky Balboa. Her cancer is in remission. So yeah. Everything's gonna be okay, Danny. Grandma was right. I would say I was skeptical about the paranormal. I've done ghost stories as dramatic pieces, but, um, you know, not really believing. That's, that's, you know, fantasy. But that changed. In 2004, me and my family were invited to Tombstone, Arizona for the first Tombstone Film Festival. And uh, our lodgings was this little B&B &B called the Buford House, which is a historical landmark that was there during the heyday of the boomtown of uh, the days of Wyatt Earp and his brothers and the Clantons and the famous OK Corral gunfight. 
When we arrived at the Buford house, we met Richard and Ruth. They were the sort of caretakers of the place, and they lived in the back of the house. They were nice people, you know? Really, they knew the history of the area, and they were very excited about us coming there, and um, I found them fascinating. We moved in, and we went on to do a general meet and greet that night at the film festival, a few blocks away. And then we came back and um, settled in for the night. Now, over my long career, I've been in many hotels. I generally have a, a pattern after so many years of doing this, of placing my things, especially my wallet, hotel key, my glasses, right next to the bed. So I claim my space on that side of the bed and went to sleep. When I woke in the morning, my wallet wasn't there. And I'm going, where's my wallet? It was right here. I'm in a rush. We have to go. I'm searching the drawers. I'm searching other pants, but I can't find my wallet. Then I turn around. Then it's sitting on the chair in the bedroom, not 15 feet away, right as plain as uh, day. It was just an odd thing. Uh, maybe how is it that I just didn't see it? It was right there. So uh, that was it, you know? Didn't think much of it after that. So we went on to the film festival, and then we came back. And that evening, sometime after dinner, the kids were playing. And uh, it was kind of like an argument going on. And I said, what's going on? My youngest son, whenever we traveled somewhere, he had to have a bag of some of his favorite toys. My son can't find some specific action figures. I said, we'll find them, don't worry. It can't have gone far. So we basically almost turned the room over trying to find them. And I kept saying, are you sure you brought them? Yes, sir, I had blah, blah, blah. And we're searching all over the place. They were in the living room, they were in the kitchen. Then we found them. My wife opened the dresser drawers to get some clothing out. Bruce. There they were. They were in my wife's lingerie drawer. No. It's not usually what my son would do, move things around and then throw a fit about it. So this was another mystery. And these little things started to add up. It seemed like somebody was playing tricks with us here. The next night, we come back from the festivities. Everyone's tired. This is on the July 4th weekend. The heat is just unbelievable. So it's wearing everybody down. Kids went upstairs, they went to bed. My wife said she's just tired. She's gonna try to get some sleep. But uh, I just couldn't sleep. It was so hot. We didn't have a general air conditioning in the place. They had just fans. And I decided to sit up and watch some television. There's a small living room with a television in it. So I'm sitting there and sweltering heat. It's quiet. All my loved ones are sleeping. I was alone. You know, it was kind of nice. It was very peaceful, very, very peaceful. I don't know how long I was there, but I was starting to get a little sleepy. All of a sudden, I just felt this whole side of my body just got cold. Like the atmosphere had changed. And just felt everything tingle for a second there. And then I just kind of got this feeling. 
someone who was standing next to me. I just felt I wasn't alone. I was alone, you know? It was kind of nice. It was very peaceful. Very, very peaceful. I don't know how long I was there, but I was starting to get a little sleepy. All of a sudden, I just felt this whole side of my body just got cold. Like the atmosphere had changed. And I just felt everything tingle for a second there. And then I just kind of got this feeling. Someone was standing next to me. I just felt I wasn't alone. And I look up. It was like this darkness on the wall, like a silhouette. Suddenly, there was this thudding, like somebody stomping on the floor right next to me. And I left up out of that chair, turned around, and there was nobody there. It's just no sound at all. So I looked around, I walked over where the hallway leads to um, where Richard and Ruth lived. And door was closed. Didn't hear anything. It was quiet. I said, all right, calm down, calm down. You know, immediately we tried to go, this, there's something logical here. There's a logical explanation for this. And there's a mirror where you would, you know, check your coat and tie. I look in this mirror, and it looks like somebody's standing in back of me, right over my shoulder. You could see a figure, shoulders in a Western-type hat, brimmed hat. He just seemed dangerous. My heart was pounding, and I was chilled. And then he just kind of faded away, and I just freaked out. I went and woke my wife up, and I said, you'll never believe what happened. Now my wife is going, oh, right, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. She wasn't affected by it at all. I did not sleep the rest of the night. I lay in bed next to my wife, and I had the sheets up, and I'm kind of looking around because now I'm freaked. Night passes. I get up early. Everyone else is getting up. I come into the kitchen and sit down with Richard. Richard's in there. Last night, I was sitting in that chair on TV. I tell Richard of this incident that I had the night before. And he says, uh, sounds like you met George. And I said, who's George? George, he's the guy who, uh... He said, George is the guy that uh, haunts this place. I thought, oh, man. And then he proceeded to elaborate. George was a young miner back in the later part of the 1800s. And there was a young, beautiful woman named Petra. It was very well known that George was so in love with her that he wanted to marry her. But in those days, he had nothing to provide for her uh, well-being. So he got a job in the mines. While he was away in the mines, she had been seen walking with some guy. <laughs> and he heard of this, and he was right over it. So he got a revolver. He came back. He uh, walked across the street from Buford House, where Petra lived. <laughs> and he shot her right there. He was so distraught over what he had just done. He walked back to the house. And put a bullet in his head. And Richard said, George is still there. But the trick on George was, Petra survived, lived to a ripe old age. He didn't. Thank <laughs> you. 
so now I put it all together. After that, I don't think I ever really got a full night's sleep there. I slept with one eye open the whole time. After this incident, I was a changed man. I was a believer. This young man did this horrible deed and then killed himself. He's stuck there in that house. I think what you do in this life, you better do the best you can. Because you may end up haunting people with whatever bad you did in this life.